Science. Engineering. Medicine. Medicine. Chemistry. Physics. Biology. Humanity. Cardiology. Computer. Public health. Global. Science. Communication. Hello everyone, I'm Gareth Mitchell. Today, testing for COVID on the Tube. How safe is London's transport network? Also, what we know so far about our responses to the coronavirus vaccines. People who've never seen any virus before all make a good response and have antibodies now that neutralise the virus. And then people who've seen the virus before and start off with a little bit of antibody, when they get their single dose of Pfizer vaccine, they have a huge boost, which is exactly what we'd expect from immunology textbooks, but it's incredibly reassuring to see. And we hear about the late event in Valentine's week that focused on affairs of the heart. Well, first of all, let's have a little wade through some of the news happenings uh, related to Imperial College. And we have Caroline Brogan in this section. So, Caroline, can we start with this dragonflies? This is a very interesting story about what drone designers and engineers can learn from dragonflies. What's going on here? Yeah, so um, not a lot is known about dragonfly flight and how they keep balanced, how they right themselves. If they're in a, if they find themselves sort of blown off course by the wind, how do they regain their um, shape in the air? And so researchers have put CGI technology onto dragonflies and dropped them from a magnetic platform and then recorded how they right themselves. So they're dropped upside down and then what was found is that if they're dropped upside down, they will do a backwards somersault to right themselves. So instead of rolling like uh, you can imagine a cat might do, they pitch backwards. And this was an interesting finding, especially the fact that the dragonflies continued to do this manoeuvre even when they were unconscious. And this suggested that it's an inbuilt writing mechanism, a passive stability uh, due to their shape rather than an active kind of decision or behaviour. And they also did the experiment when the dragonflies were dead, but the dead dragonflies did not complete the manoeuvre. But when the researchers then picked them up and posed their wings in a certain way to emulate the live dragonfly, they did the manoeuvre again. So again, that's implying that it's an inbuilt mechanism. Now, the researchers say this could be really useful for drone engineers because... A lot of technology and time and money and weight on drones goes into how they stay upright and stable. So if they could learn from the dragonflies in how they keep so stable but in a passive way, they might be able to improve the stability and balance of drones. Uh, The intriguing secrets of the dragonflies there, Uh, but less intriguing now thanks to that research, so we understand them a a bit better. Now, uh, Caroline, we are going to play a little bit of audio, and I should say, if you're not listening to this podcast on a pair of headphones or earbuds, then pause it now and go and get some headphones, because it will be worth it. Okay, all set. Here's a sound clip. Good morning. I'm here in front of you. Or maybe I'm close to Or here, or again, it could be here. Or here. Or here. Maybe here, or on the other side. Or back in front of you. Ooh, now that was all very immersive. Uh, Caroline, explain, what what is that immersive, surroundy, soundy audio all about? <laughs> so, if you think of a virtual meeting that you're doing online on Teams or Zoom, and... Your colleagues' voices are all coming from just the one speaker in front of you, usually. This new project, funded by EU Horizon 2020, is a grant given to Imperial scientists to look at how we can make audio more immersive. So instead of everything coming from one speaker, you would have your colleagues' voices emulated so that they sound like they're around a table with you. So your colleague might be to your right and you would hear them coming from your right ear. Another colleague could be across from you and you'd hear them coming from the front. And this project aims to essentially make audio more immersive. And it could also be used in things like gaming, doctor's appointments or therapy appointments. You might want a closer, more intimate feel. Whereas if you're conducting a lecture, you might want to project your voice and emulate the real lecture experience. 
So this 5.7 million euro grant will help our researchers to do that. And it's particularly useful now while we're all working from home. It is. Well, you know, the idea that a meeting could have that directionality, I'd, I'd buy that. Liven up meetings, no end. Yeah, absolutely. And just make things feel more real when everything's a bit surreal at the moment. So. <laughs> yeah, much needed. And finally, um, speaking of surreal or certainly outlandish, otherworldly, whatever you want to call it, Mars Perseverance, the rover, uh, as this podcast goes out, in fact, this week is landing, isn't it? So there's an Imperial involvement there. Tomorrow, Gareth. It's landing tomorrow yes. on Mars. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is so a... this podcast comes out on the Wednesday, so it's, yeah, it's due for touchdown on Thursday, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so this is very exciting. So this is a rover called Perseverance, built by NASA, that involves several uh, Imperial scientists, notably Sanjeev Gupta and Mark Sefton in the Department of Earth Science and Engineering. And what the rover will do is look for signs of microbial life on Mars. It'll land in a crater called the Jezero Crater, which is a 28 mile wide depression that contains sediments of an ancient river. So the scientists think that if microbial life or fossils of microbial life were to be found, it would be found in an old river because that's obviously where water was. So the rover itself will gather samples from Martian rocks and soil using its drill. And then it will store the sample cores in tubes on the Martian surface, ready for a return rover to bring 30 samples back to Earth in 2030. And you mentioned there that imperial involvement. So what does that entail exactly? So Sanjeev Gupta um, is one of the long term planners for the mission and he will work on, you know, strategic aims, make sure all the mission objectives are met. And he will also be working day to day with the engineers to search for samples of rocks for the return to Earth. Mark Sefton is an astrobiologist who specialises in recognising signs of organic life in rocks. So he will help the team to select samples for the return to Earth. And there will be a news story on Imperial's website and the NASA website itself will have amazing animations and images and a countdown if you want to watch it live. And tomorrow between 4 and 6 p.m. there will be a Reddit Ask Me Anything. The specific forum itself has not been confirmed yet, but Imperial College's Twitter will announce where to go for this AMA at 3.30 p.m. on Thursday. So do check out at Imperial College on Twitter to find out more. Will do, Caroline. So that's this Thursday, the 18th of February, or tomorrow, if you're listening to this podcast on the day that we release it. Gosh, you are quick off the mark, aren't you? Exciting times. Great. Caroline Brogan, thank you very much indeed for that. Now, for those who are still travelling around the capital at the moment, how safe is the underground and bus network? Imperial researchers are working with Transport for London to test for the virus. They're doing monthly sampling on the tube and bus network. So far, they found no trace of the virus. Hayley Dunning has been speaking to one of those on the team. I'm with Dr David Green, who has been conducting some testing into coronavirus on surfaces, both at Imperial to ensure cleaning is going well, but also with TfL. Walk me through your testing procedure on the London Transport Network. What do you test and where? We're testing both underground and bus routes around London. We're trying to represent what people are exposed to if they're travelling around. At the moment, we go from uh, our lab. We take a sample of the air in the underground station, we're doing Waterloo where we start. So while we're taking that sample of the air and we're pulling air through it about 300 litres a minute onto a filter. While that's going on, we're wiping surfaces like ticket machines, escalator handles or touch in touch out surfaces. And we're using the same sort of techniques as you do with a throat swab. So we have a cotton bud that we moisten with a tissue culture. We wipe it over a surface and then pop it back in the tube, break it off, seal it off and take it to the lab. With the air sample, you know, we're sucking air onto that filter and then we are putting that in a tube with the tissue culture to keep it stable until it gets to the lab. From the underground station, we then get on the tube and we are continuing to, to sample air as we do. And then on the tube train, we'll be swabbing surfaces of handles and buttons while we travel to the next station. And then we get off and we swab more surfaces and take more air samples. Wow, so how often do you do that? We're doing that once a month at the moment. So about the third week in the month, we take a journey around and that gives us a baseline. We've been doing it since September. 
So what have you found so far? Well, luckily we found nothing, um, which is uh, which is quite reassuring. So what we're testing for, we're testing for uh, particular gene fragments for the coronavirus, uh, the same as you would get from a, a standard coronavirus test you would take. And we're working closely with the Infectious Diseases Department at Imperial, the Barclay Lab there. Uh, so we dropped the samples off there and they analysed them using exactly the same techniques. So, I mean, that's quite reassuring for people who do still have to use the tube. But what might these results suggest about the transmission of the virus? You remember back in the early stage of the pandemic, everybody was worried about surface transmission. Uh, And gradually, as we've moved on, we've understood mainly through super spreader events that lots of transmission is occurring through droplets and aerosols in the air. I come from the aerosol science community. So as a community, we've been fairly convinced about the aerosol transmission of diseases for some time. So we started out sampling aerosols fairly early on so we've got this this history of surface and aerosol samples what it tells us it tells us that the cleaning of surfaces within the underground seems to be effective in producing traces of covid rna on surfaces and it tells us that uh, there are few enough passengers or the passengers are wearing a face covering so that uh, aerosols aren't getting into the air or there's enough ventilation within the the tube network to mean that we're not able to detect the virus yeah, I was going to say, it must be quite remarkable that you actually haven't found any in the air either. Well, the volumes we're testing are very, very large. When you see news reports of super spreader events, they tend to be you know, either large numbers of people in big areas where they're not wearing face coverings, or they're occurring in domestic environments where lots of people are, are sitting around table talking to each other for 10 or 15 minutes. And that's where you get the increase in concentration inside that enables the virus to transmit. So that's a bonus of Londoners not talking to each other on the tube. <laughs> I suppose there's one bonus I hadn't thought about, yeah. I know that this project actually came out of a larger project to start with. We've been involved in the MetaSub consortium for about three or four years now. It's a large international consortium. They're trying to understand what types of organisms live in subway systems around the world. It's a wide range of research groups from you know, New York, Hong Kong, Stockholm, all sorts of places where there are underground transport systems. And at the same week, every year, researchers go down and they sample the subway environment using exactly the same techniques again. The analysis is a little bit different. Whereas with the coronavirus test, you're looking for genetic fragments or one particular virus. For the MetaSub project, they are sequencing all of the genetic material that they can find. And then they put it through some very complex mathematics to understand what types of organisms exist in those environments. And it gives them a map of what exists in different locations over different time. So what's next for, I guess, both arms of this study? How long do you anticipate carrying on the coronavirus research? The coronavirus research, or TFL, are very keen that we continue doing it as a baseline month on month so that they can assess as we emerge from lockdown and you get more people on the underground network, whether you see changes in the prevalence of the virus. Also, it's reassuring for the travelling public that we're not able to pick it up in these environments. So we're certainly going to be doing it until the summer. That's David Green speaking there to Hayley Dunning. And Hayley's been finding out about another aspect of the pandemic, the new coronavirus variants. A recent global imperial event saw Imperial's president, Professor Alice Gast, in conversation with three of our top scientists investigating COVID-19 and thinking about what the big questions are that we now have to ask about the pandemic. We've poached a bit of it, where Professor Wendy Barclay, who is the chair in virology and the head of the Department of Infectious Diseases at Imperial, talked about the new variants and what threats they might pose. First, she talked about how these variants emerged. This virus emerged, of course, from an animal reservoir just over a year ago and found its way into a a naive population of 7 billion people around the world and spread incredibly quickly and for a while stayed relatively evolutionary static. But now we can see that the virus is mutating. We can see the virus is mutating because the world, and in particular the UK, are sequencing this virus in an unprecedented manner. There are hundreds of thousands of genome sequences of viruses collected from all around the world on the database. Around 40% of those are actually from the UK. The UK has a consortium known as COG UK, which are sequencing on on average about 5 to 10% of our viruses. So the virus is definitely mutating. 
But is that in a way we need to worry about? So the most obvious point to worry about at the moment is we're relying really on vaccines as a way out of this. And if the virus mutates in a way that the vaccines are no longer a good map for the circulating viruses, because the vaccines are all based on sequences of viruses that were isolated more than a year ago now, then we may reach a point where the current vaccines as they stand work less effectively than we'd like them to. But there are other changes that may happen as the virus mutates as well. The, the transmissibility of the virus might change, the disease it causes, the severity, the, the case fatality rate, for example, and also other treatment options such as drugs, particularly antiviral drugs if we use them. There's a whole new era of monoclonal antibody therapies which are being given to people, and these are particularly susceptible to mutations. And then another thing we need to worry about is whether or not the virus which crossed over from one animal species into humans and clearly can spread well between us, might it spread back into other animals and cause problems perhaps for our domesticated farm animals, which could affect food supplies as, as well as causing health problems. What have we seen so far with these variants? Professor Barkley talked about a mutation in Danish mink that was a concern as farm workers seemed to be catching it. However, that mutation actually made it easier to infect mink and less so humans. So it sort of faded away. However, other more worrying variants have emerged. One of the first of these to be described is the UK variant. that It's known as B1.1.7. And you can see that this variant must have arisen or emerged sometime in the autumn. But by now, it is the vast majority of virus that, that is causing SARS-CoV-2 infections in the UK. There is a lot of concern about this particular variant. It's a curious virus. There are a lot of mutations in it, and it isn't completely clear where they all came from. They appeared almost all at once. There are 22 different coding mutations across the genome of the virus, and there is some feeling that maybe the acquisition of so many mutations at once mean that this virus emerged during a long-term infection in a single individual who was probably immunocompromised and didn't manage to clear the virus in the first place. Some of these mutations increase the ability of the virus to bind to that important receptor and therefore almost certainly make it easier for the virus to enter cells when it finds itself in our noses and throats. And that's almost certainly why it's spreading better from person to person, about one and a half times better than the previous versions. And this is increasing the ability of the virus to infect a wider group of people, for example, children and younger adults more susceptible to this virus than the first one that emerged and may result in an increased death rate as well, which is something which is under intense investigation at the moment. Luckily, there's a very, very small effect on antibody recognition, and this is unlikely to affect the ability of the vaccines that we're currently using to protect us against this variant. The UK, of course, isn't the only country to produce a worrying variant, as Professor Barclay explained. South Africa was very badly hit in the first wave, and it seems that that may have promoted, if you like, the spread of a particular variant, which is now spreading and predominating rather like the UK. In South Africa, this particular yellow virus is now by far the predominant virus. And in, in addition, we have a Brazilian variant, which appears to have emerged in places like Manaus. Again, Manaus is a city in Brazil which experienced a very intense first wave almost reaching herd immunity in the first wave. And so there was a selection pressure, perhaps, to select for variants of the virus, which could overcome at least some level of naturally acquired immunity. So these three variants causing us some concern, we're trying to unravel which of these mutations that are scattered across the genome of the virus are really causing these changes. And as they're remarkable, though some of these numbers are common, between the different variants, even though they've originated completely independently in different parts of the world. And that's the virus telling us that these combinations of these different changes, when they come together, are giving the virus a remarkable ability to be a, a more efficient human pathogen than it was when it first emerged from animals. So what hope is there? Can vaccines still help us overcome the pandemic? Luckily, Professor Barkley ended on some good news with some data about responses to the vaccine and where research is headed next. People who've never seen any virus before all make a good response and have antibodies now that neutralise the virus. And then people who've seen the virus before and start off with a little bit of antibody, when they get their single dose of Pfizer vaccine, they have a huge boost 
which is exactly what we'd expect from immunology textbooks, but it's incredibly reassuring to see. Now, these tests here are done with the old virus. So this is telling us that the vaccine will protect against the virus that the vaccine was made to protect against, but that we're now growing the variant virus in our labs. And what we'll be doing next is testing whether these vaccines sera protect against the new variants. Professor Wendy Barclay. Well, finally, as Valentine's Day approached last week, affairs of the heart were on the agenda at our most recent late event. One of those taking part was trainee cardiologist Dr Ananta Ramakrishnan, who's a clinical research fellow at Imperial, and she was part of a Valentine's card-making workshop and also talking about her research, and she's talking to us now. So what did happen at the workshop? Oh, it was great fun, actually. We had Made by Micah, so Micah from Made by Micah, who's a pyrographer and an illustrator, talked us through making Valentine's cards and in particular gave us some ideas for where to start and how to think about different parts of the heart and how to illustrate them and make them colourful. We also had Dan Simpson, who's a poet in residence at Imperial. It, it was great, his, his use of words, he shared his poetry with us and then he talked to us through some poetry writing love writing poetry so and we had a really good discussion between the three of us about you know we just it was great to just spark off each other and get ideas and learn a bit more about what the rest of us in the group were doing but you did get a chance to talk about your research as well didn't you yes that was really interesting for me and i and i i gather it was interesting for some of the people that were watching in as well uh, and it sparked off a few questions too having to communicate your work for different people, for example, if you're writing a grant application or if you're writing a report or a paper, the different styles you need each time makes you think about your research in a very different way. And so then when you're trying to describe it in a way that makes sense to someone who may be completely new to it, they might have a science background, but they might not, again, makes you think about it in a different way altogether as well. So it makes you, it helps you sort of break it down and kind of remember where it's situated I mean, just in a few words then, what is your research? You probably had to sum it up in two or three sentences. So how would you do that? So it's understanding the blood flow through the heart, but also through the main arteries and how we can understand that flow in terms of, well, classically, we think about blood pressure, but we might think about breaking down the way the blood flows in terms of waves, waves that get reflected back at different parts as it travels down and trying to correlate that with clinical disease and also a long-term risk of getting cardiovascular disease. Oh, nicely summed up. And just finally then, you also had a few questions about your clinical work. What did you tell them about life in the clinic? Yeah, so uh, it was nice to talk about that. Of course, that's something that everything leads back to. That's our, that's the bulk of my you know, my work and my experience. And that's where, the, you know, where the research is really anchored to. So it was nice to be able to share that as well, because I think that one of the beauties of the collaborative work with Imperial is that you do bring in, we do have that connection with the clinical world that we bring in. Oh, well, anyway, look, I'm glad the workshop went well. That's uh, Ananta Ramakrishnan bringing this edition to a close. Just before I go, the usual reminders that there are plenty of places where you can find us. We're on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube and SoundCloud. And for visual podcasting fans, we're on this place, we're in this place called Entail. So we'll have more in about a month's time. So do join us then if you can. From me, Gareth Mitchell and all of us on the podcast team, thanks for listening and goodbye. Goodbye.